Chapter 84 Meanwhile, at the lab, I understand Empress. Yes, I know. I know. Admiral Cistern says over his communicator as he enters the lab. A finger to his lips to silence any reactions and puts a halt to several things that he immediately glares at despite the friendly conversation on the phone. Don't you worry, it will be done within the month. A simple tour with an extra look at the dark forest and a time of legends commences as numerous sorcerers begin bouncing around the homeworld. He finishes. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes. I'll be calling for volunteers within the day. He listens for a few moments more and then hangs up the phone. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I apologize for the phone call. Mr. Shea's actions have kicked open the mother of all ant hills. To what degree? It sounds like you're posting men on the Apuk homeworld, sir. I am. The appeal of soldier sorcerers with a high sense of honor is through the roof. Simply put, Mr. Shea has assured us an allegiance while on his honeymoon. I shudder to think how the man will overachieve when placed back on duty. Speaking of overachievement, I've heard some rather terrifying rumors. Care to elaborate? Sir, all we've done is as ordered. We have purchased and tested on the market alien weaponry and equipment. Unfortunately, many of these weapons have patents or black-boxed internal components for the more exotic capabilities. I find myself particularly fond of the slag pistols and grav pulsars. Dr. Samuel remarks as he gestures to what appears to be an overlarge revolver and a large conical device that has a handle coming out the back. Very well. Are they safe for testing? Admiral Cistern asks, nodding to the downright arsenal of equipment laying about the room. These are our control purchases, sir. The others are in various states of disassembly and study in another room nearby. Dr. Samuel states before grinning. Perhaps you'd like to take a few shots with each weapon in turn? Get an understanding of exactly what we're utilizing and adapting? Admiral Cistern turns it in his mind for a moment. It is important, and these devices are not only market safe, but have already been tested. Still, some small part of him feels so downright giddy at the idea of shooting dozens of alien guns that he's convinced this has to be an indulgence. Very well. I think I can afford a little indulgence now and again. Excellent, sir. Would you like me to bring down Ambassador Tal as well? Philip says from behind him, and it's all Admiral Cistern can do not to draw his pistol. Is something wrong, sir? I need to incorporate a bell into your uniform, Philip. Ah, that would be most useful. Thank you for the consideration, sir. Philip replies as there's some muffled laugher among the scientists. Admiral Cistern turns to give the sneaky butler the stink eye, but the man is gone. Not vaguely missing as the door closes, but just gone. Did anyone see how he did that? Admiral Cistern asks the room, and there's a lot of shaking heads. I, I didn't blink, but I must have. He was just gone, sir. Dr. Samuel states in a dumbfounded tone. How about we try to regain our dignity by firing alien weapons? Admiral Cistern asks, and there's a quick agreement all around. The scientists carry the weapons into the firing range next to the lab and placed out on a table behind him. A trinity of target mannequins are set up at 10 meters, 50 meters, and 100 meters. This, sir, is the CS-41 slag pistol. Ordinarily, it uses small disks of hyperheated iron as ammunition. We're in the process of modifying one to accept tritite as ammunition to make ammunition that is effectively immune to axiom manipulation, Samuel says, gesturing to the large pistol. It has minimal kickback and each of the six cylinders holds 10 pieces of ammunition. The rotation is used to properly heat the ammunition before launching. As you fire the weapon, its firing rate increases as the ammunition heats up. Unfortunately, there's only so much room in the ammunition chambers. I'm going to assume the heft is due to the dense iron ammunition, Admiral Cistern asks as he picks up the gun. Ten pounds in a handgun is nothing short of absurd. I'm afraid so, sir. 
Once we finish the modifications, the Tri-Tite variant will be lighter by two pounds in total. Not much I'll admit, but it's an improvement all around. Samuel remarks as the Admiral turns and smiles at the practical iron sights. It appears some bits of innovation and good sense were truly universal. As promised, the slag pistol has minimal kickback, more comparable to an airsoft gun than an actually deadly piece of hardware. His aim as such is ever so slightly off, and rather than the headshot it lands directly upon the neck of the target. A gruesome fate if he had hit a live target. You may have understated exactly how light the kickback was, Doctor. He chides the scientist ever so slightly. My apologies, sir. I'm more of a laboratory technician and researcher than a field soldier. It's been years since I've fired any form of pistol or rifle. Dr. Samuel remarks before doing a double take as he realizes that not only has Philip returned, but Ambassador Tal is here as well. Now? He mouths and the butler spy merely smirks. Now from what I understood of the velocity. Admiral's sister notes as he takes aim again and launches another shot from the slag pistol. The drop of the slag is exact, and he hits the second target directly in the forehead. He grins tightly before adjusting his aim again and launching a blaze of shots to the third target. He empties the ammunition chambers and completely covers the final target with burning slag. He watches the target fall to the ground in a burning heap. He nods even as a lab technician rushes up with a fire extinguisher and puts it out to the best of his ability. Ambassador Tao, good to see you. Any recommendations to the next weapons test? He asks, not even breaking his stride after turning around and seeing her. One at first she says, before walking around the table and climbing up onto a chair before standing on the table itself. Which would it be? He asks, and she leans in to give him a kiss. Philip merely smirks at the public display of affection, even as some money, both from Earth and the galaxy at large, changes hands among the scientists. Thank you so much, she whispers to him. No, thank you, my dear, he replies. Still, you didn't answer. What should I test next? He asks, and she considers before looking over the large table. She then takes a few steps to the side and picks up a large metal glove. This, I know what this is. It's a lot of fun, but generally too big for Gobes to use. We need custom models to make it work. She says as Admiral Cistern puts aside the slag pistol and takes up the glove. Two metal tubes connect from a vent system near the elbow, and the entire device refits itself around his arm like armor, but curiously leaves his fingers unbound. A strange buzzing sensation covers them, though, and he knows that they're protected by some sort of force barrier. And what is this? He asks as he feels a slight itch along his arm. He focuses on it, and to his surprise, the vents start pulling in local atmosphere, and a bright blue fireball emerges above his palm. It condenses in on itself and falls into his hand. He is protected, but he can feel a blazing hot power just beyond the film that the plasma is contained in. A plasma thrower, a dedicated all-terrain weapon system that leaves the hands free while remaining ready and dangerous at all times, this model is the CS-40 plasma thrower. It's effectively a system that gives you a massive amount of impact plasma grenades. Its power supply is slow to recharge, and if you drain it dry, it will take two hours for the weapon to fully replenish itself. It's effective everywhere but in vacuum and underwater, Dr. Samuel explains. Interesting. Admiral Cistern remarks before underhand tossing a plasma ball to the medium distance target, where before it had a streak of blackened cooling metal oozing down it, it's now completely charred black with the metal reheated back to a red-hot temperature. Sir, before you consider the further target I would advise against it, several tests have proven that throwing the plasma balls like a baseball results in the film shredding under the wind shear. It makes a very pretty display, but it doesn't do anything else. Note it. 
Admiral Cistern says as he takes a step with a long, sweeping motion that brings in pangs of remembrance. A long pitch he perfected for his sons, all the time he had spent playing softball with his boys, a piece of a life lost that was now practical in bringing the plasma thrower to maximum effectiveness. Fine throw, sir. Where did you learn to do that? One of the technicians asks. With my sons, back on Earth. Admiral Cistern says somewhat sadly as he disables the device and it collapses down into a chunky bracer with fingerless glove again. Edward and Peter? Ambassador Tal asks, and Admiral Cistern nods. Philip nods to himself slightly, clearly taking note of the fact that the two have been speaking about personal issues. All right, next on the list? Something recommended by the EFL, this is an advanced plasma caster. In particular, this is the CS-12 plasma launcher. It has two settings, burst and stream. The first is effectively a precision mode, the second a blue-tinted flamethrower, Dr. Samuel says, gesturing to a larger-looking rifle. Common to most plasma weaponry, it has obvious vents on the side used to pull in local gases that it then compresses, agitates, and ignites into plasma before launching it. Most of the vents, while large enough to give plasma weaponry a distinctive profile, are also short. These ones go down the entire length of the rifle, with the exception of large handles coming out the side. I can't help but notice a certain pattern in the names and number. We bought two copies of the CS-1250 package, a bundle deal that with the savings means the last five weapons are essentially free, or rather, ten in this case. Dr. Samuel explains, Weapons 1 through 10 are different variants of the laser weapons, with 11 through 20 being different plasma throwers. First is the handheld type followed by the mounted type designed for use in vehicles, mech armor, and emplacements. 1, 2, 11, and 12 are all basic rifle variants. After that, we've got rapid fire followed by high precision spread variants like a shotgun and stealth variants, which are basically pistols. Interesting. For a mounted weapon, this is a very easily handled. Generally, sir, it means there's greater output and the accuracy is built into the vehicle. Furthermore, it eats through its internal power supply in a hurry and has to rely on whatever source it's hooked up to. You have maybe five shots with that thing or three seconds of concentrated plasma. On even a simple civilian-grade hoverboard, the power supply would theoretically be so high that it's simply not capable of depleting its reserves. On a child's toy, Admiral Cistern demands in disbelief, The galaxy is an absurd place, sir, Dr. Samuel says, as Admiral Cistern hefts up the weapon and quickly burns a hole through the furthest target that had just been replaced. Please tell me there's at least some form of license for this kind of hardware, Admiral Cistern asks, trying to find some kind of sanity. Afraid not, I was 11 when I bought my first laser cannon. I sold jade beads and bone knives until I had the discs needed. Ambassador Tal says somewhat wryly, No, sir. From what we understand, the black market is robust enough that there's been a general surrender in attempts to license vehicles and equipment. Extremely efficient and user-friendly manufacturing equipment means that it's literally child's play to get high-end weapons. Dr. Samuel confirms and Admiral Cistern sighs. The lack of argument, blowback, or even scorn from registering kinetic weaponry as cultural dress suddenly makes a great deal more sense. He had hoped the reports were exaggerations.